Vamos a arrancar, vamos a arrancar, vamos a arrancar. Vamos a arrancar. Vamos a verlo de a 10 minutos por 10 minutos. Vamos a verlo, vamos a activar subtítulo y dale. Qué locura, vos. Qué hijo de puta, vos. I've been a long time hater of fairy tale for a while and I have my reasons for it. Fairy tale is actually good at ¿Por qué no lo pone? Anime. <laughs> Boy, it is my contention, folks, that fairy tale is the absolute worst most popular series in the world. To start this video, I want to say something. I love fairy tale. I don't love it ironically. I don't love it and say it's trash. I don't love it just because of the hot girls. No, I love fairy tale and think it's a really good, maybe even great anime despite its downsides. So, nos dejas verlo por partes, no? Nos vas a dejar, no? Onda, vemos una parte, después hacemos otra cosa, después vemos otra parte. No, velocidad por dos no, porque sería robarle la plata. Okay. Are the people who would have disliked this video no matter what I say gone? Yeah, yeah, all right. So, to begin, if you haven't watched or heard of Fairy Tale, you're either living under a rock or you don't watch anime. I would say if you haven't watched it to do so, to know everything before I basically spoil the entire show and meticulously talk about every aspect and detail I like in every arc, but, well, there's 328 episodes of the show. I'm making this video mostly for people who already know about the show and or have watched it. So, if you mind every spoiler possible about this show being being ruined for you, then click off. If you've either watched the show or don't mind that, well, welcome to this retrospective. I normally wouldn't put this kind of message here, but I know there's gonna be those people who shout, no spoiler warning, really? And I didn't want that. Otherwise, enjoy the video and hopefully don't crucify me for my controversial takes. Now, I know how much of a controversial opinion it is to love fairy tale, let alone like it. Among anime, it's just one of those shows. Ante que termine. Muchas gracias, Sol. Gracias, Sol. Gracias. Eh, antes de que termine este extensible, tenemos que llevar, llenar la barra épica. Hay que llenarla. You're constantly told is trash and not worth watching. Look up fairy tale reviews. Other than Anime America and Nuxtaku, almost every video talking about fairy tale is some kind of rant about how terrible it is. I'd compare the level of hatred for fairy tale and anime to be on a similar scale to little boys in the 2010s with Justin Bieber or Frozen. They didn't know why they were supposed to hate these things. It was just a simple matter of you're supposed to hate it, and if you don't, something is wrong with you. Even with such a standard in the general anime community, fairy tale retains a large fan base of people. People who tend to not speak up about the series they like from fear of being ostracized for having quote unquote bad taste. Most people who like fairy tale and want to defend something brought up in conversation about it always have to preface the statement with, yeah, I know fairy tale is trash, but, and they would go on to bring up a. Les digo algo. Les digo algo que puede ser que les parezca tonto. Está interesante lo que dice el video. Está interesante. La verdad, está interesante lo que dice. Es algo que no, que no se ha hablado y está interesante lo que dice. Digo. Watch it by 30 means chunks. Punishment for not showing me your nipple. Dale. Positive. Plenty of people also iba a hacer eso, iba a vivir en 30 minutos. Anime they ever watched, so critics like to point to this and say the only reason several people like the series is because of nostalgia bias back when they barely had taste. I tell you, being a fairy tale fan isn't easy. I'm not saying that because it's hard to like with all its flaws, but rather it's hard to be a fan of it when everyone else is always saying how garbage it is. I've heard it called a poor man's attempt at one piece, garbage, trash, bleach piece, and many other insults. Before I made this video, I hadn't 
watched Fairy Tale in over a year, and I'd only seen up to right after Magic Games ended, plus I'd heard spoilers about the ending being really bad. In that time, I watched many of the reviews against Fairy Tale, and as my memory dulled about it, I started to believe that they were alright, and Fairy Tale was just a garbage show I happened to like because it was when my taste was still developing. That's when I saw part of a video made by Nextaku. I didn't watch the entire thing at first because of spoilers, but. El tema de los Dragon Slayer a mí me encantaba, amigo. Y este opening de Fairy Tail. Lo que me generó Fairy Tail. Pocas se lo generaron. But the bit I did see gave me enough of a want to try and give the series another chance. I watched the rest of that video after I finished my binge. And I okay, you're crazy man WTFXD. I had so much to talk about for this video. I decided the only way for me to get all my thoughts out would be to cover every single arc. Yes, that includes the filler arcs which Fairy Tail had surprisingly few of, other than the Daphne arc. Uh, that one sucks shit and can go die in a hole for all I care. I guess the best way to start this retrospective slash review slash... Es que lo que tiene Fairy Tail es que hay muchas cosas incoherentes pero es divertida siempre. No hay un momento en el que Fairy Tail te parezca aburrida. Es fumada tras fumada y Natsu pela cosa rota tras cosa rota pero es divertida. Many other things would just be to get started. It all begins with our introduction to Lucy, the celestial spirit mage looking to join Fairy Tail. She meets a character named Natsu the Salamander, who is a dragon slaying wizard, and Happy, a blue cat, by accident without knowing who they are, she almost gets kidnapped and with their help beats her attempted captors, then they run off to get Lucy into Fairy Tail. From our first introduction to the Fairy Tail Guild Hall in episode 2, the atmosphere is laid out perfectly. Natsu comes in storming, ready to punch someone, Grey and Natsu fight often, and he's known to take off his clothes. Si te gusta el shonen genérico de pura aventura, eso es Fairy Tail. Loki womanizes. It's all so much to take in, but right away you can tell it feels like a real home for all the weirdos living there. They might be the weirdest, most eccentric people out there, but they feel at home and aren't afraid to show their true selves to their guildmates. Mira Jane is seen as the most normal among them, and she's getting thrown around just as much without a care in the world because this is so normal and she genuinely enjoys it. Of course, for when the guild gets too rambunctious, there's the guildmaster Makarov. Even really early on we get to know about his character. He breaks up fights among his basically surrogate children he raised, but he understands why they do what they do because he's a fucking loony guy himself. The entire guild works so well together because everyone feels at home and like a family. The bond is shown further when Natsu helps Romeo get his dad Makao from the mountains when he goes missing, because just like Romeo, Natsu and the other members of Fairy Tale have all felt lost in some way and don't want that burden on other members. It's a home for the outcasts from society who have nowhere other place to go and can just <laughs> act like the people that they truly are without being judged. <laughs> After that event, we get to meet Urza, the older sister type character to Natsu and Grey. She's seriously feared by the other members for being so strict and constantly splitting up Grey and Natsu's fights, but she still shows compassion for them in her own awkward way. Other than her, there are the other strongest members, Loxus and Mystigan. Just like it's the norm for characters to act the way they do in the guild, when Mystigan shows up to get his jobs, he puts everyone to sleep so they don't bother him, adding really well to the mystery of his character. Loxus is mostly just a passive figure in these first few arcs, but he's mostly just a jerk. Around this time is when we get to the first character-focused plot. <laughs> One of my favorite aspects of Fairy Tale is that it allows several of the characters, either seemingly big or seemingly small, to get major plot points in the series rather than having one be all end all protagonist that gets all the backstory and character moments. The reason behind this is simple, and I think Nux put it the best that the guild itself is the main protagonist of the series. We don't have just one guild member we follow throughout the series. Among the large cast, Natsu is a prominent figure, but he doesn't have too many moments before the Deberían Tartarus animar de nuevo Rave Master. Uno de los mejores mangas que leí. Uh, sí, Rain Master lo llegan a animar, me vuelvo loco. Es una paja, Rain Master. Mi primera paja. The series. His main character goal is to find Igneal, and while eventually we do get some time devoted to this as he meets more dragon slayers and slowly moves the plot along with him, in all that in between we get to see the journeys of so many other members in the guild. As a character, one of Natsu's other main goals is to protect the ones he loves and help them with their own issues, and those friends all reside within Fairy Tail. The main protagonist all the characters come from, are connected by, protect together, and hopefully return to as a safe haven for them. Again, referencing Nux, on on a meta level, you feel like a member of the guild yourself. Fairy Tale is an open place where weird people with the right ideas can all congregate and hang out. You don't even necessarily need to be a wizard, just a do-gooder who has the ideals of Fairy Tale. It's a cozy. Yo le juro que yo lloré muy fuerte cuando 
cuando Laxus lo echan del gremio y, y está ahí viendo el festival y todos hacen la seña de que siempre serán nakamas. ¡Pa! La única vez que acepto la palabra nakama. Siempre, la única, que le hace así. Que le hacen así y él recuerda a su abuelo y empieza a decir, abuelo. The resting place everyone likes to be around when they aren't off on their own adventures. In real life, that could just mean going through your day to day as the weird person you might see yourself as and coming home to feel welcomed while watching fairy tale. All the members have their own quirks that they can. Tipo final de alabasta. No. Porque en fairy tale hacen esto para alguien que creció junto a ellos y se desvió del camino. Pero lo siguen considerando un familiar. No a una pelotuda que con la que convivieron dos semanas. Y le salvaron el culo 32 veces y le hacen así para sentirse todos amigos. No compares a Laxus con Bibi, por favor. Express freely in the guild, just like you would like to do in your own spot for hanging out with friends. And by extension, you feel a deeper connection to all these characters you see as guildmates when they go through trials with other members at their side. The creator, Hiro Mashima, always said Fairy Tale was based on his experience drinking out with friends at a pub, and you feel that kind of earnest energy with Fairy Tale. Getting to the first character arc, Grey and his backstory are the first really explored. Up till this arc, Grey has just been the weird rival to Natsu, who takes off his clothes. Do I want people? So, you want to, to, to attack people, do it, do it. Today, the stream is yours, but only 10 seconds. For no reason, but in fairy tale, even some of the smallest traits can be made from tragic pasts. Grey was once a regular kid whose village got attacked by Deliora, a demon from the book of the Dark Wizard Zareph. While his family didn't survive, Grey was saved by a passing ice mage and her pupil named Ur and Leon. During his time with Ur, all Grey could think about was learning magic for revenge. Ur's specialty being ice mage magic. To access this type of magic, one has to start by stripping down in the snow to become one with the cold. As their training continued, the three became more like a small family of their own until Grey learned where Delior was going next and attempted to intercept it. In the end, there was very little he could do, and Or had to step in to take it down. She tells Grey and Leon to leave because of how powerful it is, but Leon isn't ready to accept that Or might not win. You see, his entire reason for studying under her was because he thought she was the strongest wizard possible, and he strived to try and surpass her, seeing this possible loss as a betrayal. In that moment of blind rage, he tries to use the forbidden spell Ice Shell without knowing the side effects of its use. Or knocks him out and tells Grey to tell Leon that she died rather than her using Ice Shell herself. What Ice Shell does is it encases your foe in a powerful, almost unbreakable ice, but the cost is the caster's own body becomes that ice. She doesn't want Leon to know since he'd spend his entire life trying to turn her back. Grey tells Leon what Ur wanted, and he walks away calling Grey a murderer for what happened. It was Gabo meets six just resubed for ocho months. Ocho meses de esta hermosa relación, se sabe que estas nalgas son del reseñas. Hermoso culo. Fairy tale. All that time after, he'd been training to try and honor his master's wish for him to become stronger and look towards the future. Unfortunately, I'm chill he now. still couldn't Gonna let you all lie. and denied for having now. been responsible for Ur's death for a full decade. So, una pregunta. ¿Vos te gusta Fairy Tale, no? ¿Te gusta? Natsu podrá ser un mal personaje, pero su diseño la rompe. Sigo esperando el Natsu X Lucy. Oh, no. Trying to make good on it, even attempting to use Ice Shell himself to stop Leon. Natsu obviously stops him because just doing what his master did isn't going to solve the problem, and there are other ways to beat Leon that don't end in death. This is one of the Necesitamos un emote de Fairy Tail, boludo. First moments we see the true colors of Grey and Natsu's relationship. They fight and call each other idiots and such, but they're still part of a family. Ah, oh, ¿y sabe lo que podemos hacer? 
poner emotes de personajes para las metas de bits. ¿Viste que cuando vos determinás, donás determinados bits, te sale un emote que va cambiando el color? Podemos poner eh, que sea, si donás 100 bits, te sale Natsu, eh, a los 1000 te sale Alphonse y todo así. And can get through conflicts <laughs> without Urza always needing to be there. The motivation <laughs> helps Gray to beat Leon by seeing through his arrogance, trying to use one hand instead of two to make ice creations, thinking he's mastered it and believes this only further proves he's surpassed Ur, who used two hands. The reason he was taught to use two hands, however, was so his creations were more solid and sturdy. Gray uses this to his advantage and beats Leon, but Deliora is still unfrozen. It looks like Natsu might fight it, but Deliora takes a single swing and falls dead. This is because Ur's magic had not only been keeping the demon hostage, she'd also been weakening it to the point Deliora died a long time ago. The situation is just a perfect summation of why trying to return to the past instead of looking towards the future can only cause pain and suffering for no return. Leon and the villagers spent three years spying out Deliora with the hope he'd beat it, but they couldn't fight something that already died. With Leon left reflecting on this, the others returned to the guild only for yeah. another problem to rear its head their way. The Phantom Lord arc starts with a tragic event in the destruction of the Guild Hall. No one was there to be harmed by the destruction, but this was still an act on their, and really sort of our, home. This action cements Phantom Lord as a petty guild, willing to destroy property when no one else is looking, but they aren't considered worth retaliating against until a character named Levy and her crew are crucified in town for all. Oh, y esta parte fue buenísima. Phantom Lord didn't need to do this to get their message across, and it wasn't even in their plan. Gajiel, the Iron Dragon Slayer, just did it to provoke them further, and seeing those members of the guild, however small they may be, hung up and shown to all the other members, only helps the audience sympathize with them as if members of your own family have been harmed. Each member of fairy tale we see, whether powerful or not, is treated with the respect any other member has. The sentiment is only further shared when Lucy is kidnapped as well. After a botched rescue mission at one of Phantom Lord's guild spots, not so unhappy are able to find Lucy and get ready for an all-out attack from Phantom Lord's huge moving base with a Jupiter cannon attached to it. For reference, one blast from this would be enough to destroy the entire guild in one shot. Phantom might seem unprovoked here, but the reason they're doing this isn't out of a grudge or anything like that, but rather they're getting Lucy for her father. I'll talk about him later, but right now the guild needs to fend off Phantom Lord, destroy the Jupiter Cannon before it fires again, and win the battle all without the help of Makarov, who was taken down in the rescue mission. Lucy contemplates giving herself up in the beginning, but the entire guild collectively says they can't allow her to do that, since she's part of the family now, and family doesn't give up members. The battle Opa! starts with Natsu destroying the cannon's lacrima in a mostly uneventful fight, but the golem created from the base is still casting the spell that could wipe fairy tale out. The key to stopping no it is to look at it. Aunque yo no pueda ver donde estén, siempre los estaré observando y cuidando. Su abuelo se los dice is beating the element four of Phantom Lord, and Natsu just beat one of them, so the base starts to get slower. As Grey reaches the base, we get introduced to Juvia, the Rain Woman. She has a pretty simple backstory. No one ever wanted to be friends with her because she would bring rain. Cuando tengas coito, y pienses que puede ser que no la satis no logres satisfacer a esa mujer, yo voy a estar ahí diciéndote, eres el mejor. Tú puedes gloominess everywhere she went. She tried everything to not keep being hurt by people, including sewing hundreds of dolls called Teru Teru Bozu, which are made with the express purpose of wishing for good weather. She hated herself for the disdain she brought from her melancholy personality, so she completely closed off her emotions to all other people. She starts showing emotion again when she meets no Grey, hope. the first person to genuinely show concern for and be kind to her. She goes on to have a major obsession with Grey throughout the rest of the series, but I think it's perfectly justified from her perspective and she still has her own character after she decides to join Fairy Tale when the battle's over. Other than Juvia's fight with Grey, the major battle I want to talk about is Elfman's battle with Le Soul. Natsu's battle with Gajiel had its own highlights, but Elfman as a character developed way more in his battle. Getting some backstory on Elfman, he and his sister Lizana and Mira were banished from their hometown when Mira absorbed the soul of a demon to stop it from causing trouble, and she was labeled one herself. They traveled all around Fiore trying to look for help getting Mira back to normal. 
until they reached Fairy Tail and met Makarov. He was the first person not scared of Mira's ability, and taught her siblings to use similar takeover spells so she could feel like she was one of them. The only one who struggled with it being Elfman. Many years later, the three went on an S-Class quest, and Elfman took over the soul of a beast he wasn't able to control. And before we learned about this, there was always an underlying tragedy about what happened to Lizana, since she isn't hanging around the guild hall. When Elfman confronts Sol, Sol looks into Elfman's memories to see that Lizana died when she tried to calm Elfman down while in beast form. This is a guilt he's been living with for years, thinking he killed his younger sister he was trying to protect, and this backstory plays into why he's always preaching about being a real man. The permanent scar on his eye reminds him every day of what he did when he, as he saw it, couldn't be man enough to protect his siblings. Sol scans his memories of this and creates marionette-like copies of Lizana, putting Elfman in a state of still guilt. This gives Sol the chance to almost entrap Elfman in a rock layer that would have had him stuck in a cycle of remembering his tragic past forever. By going through his memories of Lizana, Elfman realizes she would have wanted him to live, and when Mira cries out to him as she's about to die herself, he gets the courage to finally control a full body takeover. This moment where he controls the takeover, beats Sol, and rescues Mira Jane is such a great character moment for him, and shows to Mira that he's more capable than she thought. Once the dust of all battles have settled, and all is said and done, Makarov recovers and deals the final blow to Phantom Lord by beating the Master Jose using No, Fairy. la resurrección de Lisana es una poronga. La resurrección de Lisana es una poronga. Con el arco que habían tenido Mira Jane y y cómo es? Elfman estaba perfecto. La resurrección de Lisana, bueno, resurrección. Estaba en Edolas. La resurrección una porón. law for the first time, giving some decent foreshadowing to the three most powerful fairy spells. At first glance, for people who watch the arc, this might seem like it isn't the end because Phantom Lord has other branches all over Fiore, but that's what Mystigan was getting up to while he was gone. The guild thinks he was just too good to show up, but he was really defeating every single branch in Phantom Lord without telling anyone about it. All we got to see is him leaving all the other phantom flags to drift in the wind like the mysterious badass he is. Mystigan's one of my favorite characters to talk about, but don't worry, that'll be for another arc. Back to Lucy in this whole mess. <coughs> she sees all her guildmates cheering for. Qué pijudo, que era Mr. Gambo. El, el verdadero hombre pija. El verdadero hombre pija. Finally winning and getting to keep her with them, but she knows she has one last task to do. She leaves home and heads for the Heartphilia estate. The reason Phantom Lord was after Lucy in the first place was because she's a runaway from home, but not just any home. She's the daughter of one of the richest men in all of Fiore, but chose to run away from that to pursue a dream with Fairy Tail. That might sound selfish under normal circumstances, but to Lucy, it only made sense because she wanted to find a true family. Her mom, who was a celestial spirit wizard herself, and gave Lucy her first keys, died when Lucy was really young. Growing up on a huge plantation with no other kids to play with, she first looked to her dad for help, but he was always working. The greatest summation of their relationship is when Lucy gives her father a rice ball of his face, sort of just to be nice to him, and he not only doesn't care, he reprimands Lucy for interfering with his work and yells her out of the room not realizing that it's her birthday. He was never a father to her. Lucy had to be raised by all the staff around, and some of her only friends to interact with were her spirits like Aquarius. Fairy Tail was such a big deal to her because despite not being there for long, she finally felt like she had become part of a massive, caring family. When Lucy does decide to come back, the staff all surround her and get her ready to meet her dad, but he himself stays at his desk, waiting for her to come up despite her being gone for over a year at that point. Once Lucy does get up, he starts out by scolding her for running away and joining a guild without a hint of remorse for how he treated her before. In fact, the only reason he wanted her was so he could marry her off to some other dickhead to expand his estate. Lucy obviously tells him off in this great moment where she rips off her dress and says, if you come after Fairy Tail, she'll defeat him just like any other enemy. The chances to talk are gone now because Lucy can't trust him, and this moment hit especially hard because, like algo. I said before, Yo Fairy Tail isn't just the character of Fairy Tail, it's your guild. And when a member of your guild sticks up to you about their hecho. blood relatives, it really helps you know just how strong that guild's bond is. <laughs> she leaves her father's room for the last time and goes back to Fairy Tail as she should. Before I move on to the next big arc, though, we gotta talk about Loki. <laughs> At this point, you've hopefully noticed all the members of Fairy Tail carry heavy emotional baggage that led them to the guild in the first place. And the show isn't done revealing backstories and motivations, but sometimes when the past of a character in Fairy Tail is revealed, I'm seriously shocked. You're telling me that Loki, 
The womanizing pretty boy who's been mostly absent from the series so far has a not only tragic but well set up and foreshadowed backstory. Yeah, surprisingly. His arc only lasts two episodes, but it's shocking just how well paced it is. Up till now we've known little about Loki. We know he's a womanizer, sort of gentlemanly below the surface, which is shown when he fights for Lucy and gets her keys back, and most importantly, he has bad relationships with celestial wizards and fears Lucy. The arc starts with Loki anonymously quitting the guild and breaking up with all his girlfriends after he tells Lucy he doesn't have long to live. She finds him at the grave of a celestial wizard, or more specifically, his previous master. Loki, it turns out, is a spirit himself, who was banished from the celestial spirit world after he supposedly killed Karen. What happened was he, Leo the Lion, and his friend Ares the Ram were both owned by an abusive user named Karen who took out her frustrations on spirits in private. Loki tried to end the cycle by opening his own gate and demanding Karen releases the two from their contract. I forgot to mention this, but when humans get celestial spirit keys, the user makes a contract with the spirit for when they can be summoned. Loki expected Karen to break, but after a month of not getting jobs, she went off on one and ended up dying. Loki didn't mean for it to happen, and it really wasn't his fault, but he shouldered the guilt of the incident and was banished from the spirit world for technically breaking the celestial law of the spirit never killing the master. And the thing about spirits in the human world is they can't stay there for long consecutive periods of time. Loki had been there for three whole years years subsiding off of the magic he got when he first summoned himself. Progressively, he kept getting bigger until eventually he started deteriorating. <laughs> Muchas gracias, aficion. Muchas gracias. Destra, muchas gracias. Hugo se doce just resubet for dos months. Te quiero, gorda puta. Yo te quiero más, gorda puta. Muchas gracias, aficion. Esto es para vosotros. Destrada de barra baja 1819 just resubet for 3 months. SO6 mayor que 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 Sofi Humo. Se están acabando algunas subs. A algunos se le ha acabado la sub. Renuévela. Porque hemos bajado a 1047. Y eso no puede ser. No puede ser. Occupied with girls was to mask the pain that he felt from being in the human world. He only came to Karen's grave so that he could stay there and wait for himself to drift away into nothingness. Lucy tries to force Loki to go back to the spirit world and claims whoever said he killed Karen needs to know that they're wrong, so she and Loki get an audience with the Celestial Spirit King. In an act using up all her magic, Lucy summons her spirits all at once to tell Loki it wasn't his fault for what happened to Karen, and that dying would only cause more sadness for all the people that care about him. The Spirit King hears her plea and agrees to let Loki back in. After that, Loki gives Lucy his key, symbolizing their stronger connection as characters. And yeah, this was a really small arc, but I think it was worth talking about nonetheless. <laughs> And thus we're brought to the confrontation of Urza's past. After some old friends kidnap her and knock out the others at a casino, they need to try and get her back while she has to deal with what happened in her absence to her old friends. One of the first things we hear from Urza's friends is them asking why she betrayed Jalal. And se dan cuenta de que Fairy Tail dura un tercio de lo que va One Piece, e incluso Fairy Tail, siendo una serie que mata poco, mató más personajes que Fairy Tail. Understand that we need to look at Urza's childhood. Buenas como anda admin puede saludar por fa diamond barra baja buf. Un saludo a diamond barra baja buf. Friends were once childhood. Not being here for a time after those hours from now. Se osa moving to the US to make it easier to trade with the cartel and shit. ¿Cuándo te vas a mudar para Estados Unidos, so? Slaves captured by a cult trying to resurrect the Black Wizard Zareph using a tower called the R System. Among Urza and her friends was Jalal, who gave Urza. No. No fue solo un personaje. Murió acá. Murió la. La conchuda de la hija de Ur, que se hizo vieja y murió. Murió el puto de. El puto de. La puta de Lucy el futuro. 
was that her last name based on her hair, and took the fall for one of the other's plans when it went wrong, being sent off to be tortured. During his stay in solitude, he comes across an apparition that claims to be Seraph himself, and that only belonged to see him because he was chosen to carry out Seraph's work, and to be the false inside the false eye. I kind of thought that would have been the explanation for why he has that weird eye tattoo, but no, he just always had that, though coincidentally the being also went inside the same eye that the eye tattoo is around. At the same time, Urza incites a revolt in the prison and helps everyone escape to lifeboats. During the battle, she's almost fired on but is saved by a character known as Grandpa Rob, who once belonged to the Fairy Tale Guild. He crumbled. Y no mataron. ¿Cómo se llama? El rubio ese de los Dragon Slayer. No mató al al maestro de su gremio. Cuando lastimó a Lector. Muchas gracias, afición. Este para vosotros. Chafadet, muchas gracias por el nivel 1. Chafardet just resubed for 3 months. ¿Cómo que no? Si después lo revivieron como demonio. away and in that moment Urza awakens her magic potential and takes up the random weapons and supplies around her to attack with, explaining why she ended up choosing to use Requip as her main set of magic and I find that pretty clever. She tries to get Joel to come with them but he has... ¿Se dan cuenta de que los buenos en Fairy Tail no muere nadie? ¿Pero de los malos mueren todos? Eh, los de Álvarez murieron todos. Todos. Eh, el que era uno de, de el coso, el mago, todos. Todos los malos murieron, pero a los buenos no mataba a nadie, el cagón. Plans, wanting to resurrect Zeref himself now by using the R system to take him and the others to paradise. Urza chooses to run away instead, and Ay, Jalal murió, says that's fine, but if she ever tries Ignil to tell murió, the others about Jalal's intentions or decides to come back at any point, he'll kill them all. From this fear, Urza ran to fairy tales so she could try and get stronger for the others and maybe come back someday. Obviously, Jalal tells them lies, but of them, a character named Simon knows it wasn't the truth and helps Urza navigate the power along with the others when they arrive. Si no me equivoco, Zeref mató al Godslayer de Crimson y a su hijo. Y ahora about Jalal's trickery and tells her guildmates about her past. The gang has to deal with a few members of a mercenary guild called Trinity Raven, and Juvia shows she's able to be more than the person she was in the previous arc. Of the battles before Jalal, the most important was definitely Urza's battle with Ikaruga, a character whose blade could cut through any metal. This battle shows Urza she can't rely only on her armor to not only protect her body, but also her heart from the feelings of other people. As a character, Urza's always been serious about everything and really powerful. Powerful, but from that, during moments of downtime, she comes off as awkward from the time spent hardening her heart to not be damaged again. At the moment she finally understands her friends can help her move on past her old relationships towards new chances, however, she gets clear hard clothing, increasing her speed and attack power at the price of defense. With it, she easily ¿En qué momento hay viajes en el tiempo en Fairy Tail? Desde que tenés a Rogue el futuro. beats Ikaruga and goes on to face Jalal with her heart open. Unfortunately es verdad, for her, Jalal is anticipating it. As they're fighting, Jalal's other part of the plan is going into the works with Toma his brother C-Grade and his uno. assistant Uf. Muchas gracias, afición. Este para vosotros. Sí. Tomato los 79 just resubed for uno month. A weapon that could destroy entire villages in one blast and needs the approval of a percentage of council members to fire. Though one member of the council named Mr. Yajima stays firm on not firing the cannon, it gets ready to do so. Urza gets Jalal to his knees, but knowing of the upcoming Ethereum blast and still having feelings for him, decides to spare his life and hug as they wait for their imminent deaths. That is, until they don't die. Instead, Jalal's true, real, actual plan begins when the tower absorbs the energy of the Ethereon and becomes one giant lacrima. The only thing keeping it from activating is a human sacrifice. And among the people in the tower at this point, there are only Simon, Jalal, Urza, and Natsu. At least until Seagrain shows up out of nowhere. In actuality, they were one in the same the entire time, just with split magic power. Urza tries to fight back, but back during their embrace, Jalal manipulated Urza's drop guard to implant a 
bind snakes so she wouldn't be able to move when he sacrifices her. Natsu comes to the rescue, but doesn't seem to stand a chance against Jalal, having exhausted his own energy. Natsu tries to keep fighting for Urza, but right as Jalal's about to fire a most likely fatal spell on him, Urza moves in the way to block it. But before she can take it, Simon steps in in front of her and takes a blast full force. He confesses his long-lasting love for Urza and her spirit, and he dies, making Urza finally drop for the first time and cry over his death. When all seems hopeless, Natsu decides the best course of action is to consume the Ether Nano of the tower, which is basically pure magic energy, and fight Jalal with a temporary power boost. He beats Jalal, but many people are critical of this scene for Natsu getting a random power boost that only lasts for this scene and no others. To counter that point, I'd like to, for one last time, refer back to Nextaku's video, where he explains better than I could that this arc isn't just about Urza opening her heart to others and beating Jalal. It's about choosing between overcoming your past for your new family, or or succumbing to it under the corrupt morals of your past. Jalal is everything Urza stands against, and used their bond as a way to manipulate her and the other slaves. He used her and tormented her mind to the point she was left crying. Natsu standing up for Urza and her set of principles in the name of her true family is one of the most fitting ways to conclude that message. He shouldn't be stronger than Jalal. He should lose, but he doesn't. I won't say this scene is perfect, but the emotional resonance surrounding it is great. After everything finally cools down, Urza's past and present collide together in a party where she can accept and cherish both now that the meddling influence is left. Ultimately, Urza's old friends decide to leave instead of joining Fairy Tale, but she makes sure they don't leave without a touching goodbye. It's sweet, humbling, and a perfect way to cap off one of my favorite smaller arcs in the series. Right when the gang gets back to Fairy Tale, some big changes are happening to the guild. Gajio, along with Juvia, have become new members of the guild, and at first everyone's hostile towards the idea, but Levi, out of all of them, has chosen to forgive Gajio, so they choose to tolerate him. That is, other than Jet and Droy. These guys are the two that were hung up along with Levy, and to get their own revenge on Gajio, they attack him, and think he's all talk when in reality it becomes clear he just isn't fighting back. Levy reasons he's doing this to gain their acceptance, and is confirmed when Loxus shows up, absolutely beats on Gajio, and almost hits Levy when he gets back up and defends her. With Loxus's arrival, he wants to make some big changes as Guild Master, starting by taking it over with his small set of friends the Thunder God tribe. His reasoning is... Frid, me encantaba Frid, boludo. Qué buen personaje Frid con su, con su magia esa que tenía de, de, de los sellos eses. The guild has gotten the reputation of being weak, and he also still holds a grudge against his grandfather, Master Makarov, for kicking out Loxus' father when he got up to some shady shit. He starts his takeover by freezing all the girls with the Stone Eyes ability Evergreen has, under threat of shattering them so the guild complies, and he uses his right hand Freed's enchantments to not only keep Makarov from interfering, but also so traps can be set up around the city where members of the guild have to fight against each other. For some reason, Natsu and Gajil also can't leave, even though the enchantment only keeps people over 80 in the guild hall. So this gives some subtle foreshadowing in advance to when things come back. Ah, claro. Cuando cuando Fairy Tail te mete este foreshadowing de que Natsu y Gashin no puedan salir cuando solo podía los mayores 80, ese foreshadowing no cuenta. Si no de One Piece no cuenta, chupapijas. Urza is able to break out since one of her eyes is artificial, so Evergreen's spell didn't completely work on her. She goes after and defeats Evergreen pretty easily, getting all the girls freed, meaning Loxus has to get some new hostages. To achieve this, the mad lad puts thunder lacrima all around Magnolia that'll explode if any guild member goes off for help. Just one of these exploding is enough to seriously damage the attacker, so they have to obey or Magnolia is just gone. All the girls go ahead to fight other than Levy, who stays behind to rewrite Freed's enchantments to get the Dragon Slayers out. First, Grey and Lucy beat the Sky Big Slow. It's a standard fight, nothing too worthy of note. Next, Kana and Juvia get caught in one of Freed's enchantments, and like all the others, are forced to fight. Juvia defines her character some more, and really cements herself as a member of Fairy Tale when, instead of fighting, she attacks the Lacrima above. So she can fall instead, because of course, true family doesn't hurt each other. After this, Mira Jane shows off her magic for the first time, and we finally get to see what 
her takeover power is, that being demon takeover magic, and it's just as awesome as it sounds. With all his minions beaten, Loxus is steaming mad when Mystigan of all people shows up. Natsu, Gajiel, and Urza also show up as they're fighting, and that's when we get the big reveal of Mystigan. He's Jalal, or should I say, he is a guy that looks like Jalal. Foreshadowing. There's a surprising amount of it so early on in the story. Well, anyway, Natsu and Gashi will fight him to get. Vieron, si yo fuera un fan de estúpido de Felitel, diría: Foreshadowing, Majima lo hizo de nuevo. And while doing so, they realize Loxus doesn't just use lightning, he's also a lightning dragon slayer, but he wasn't raised by a dragon. His father actually implanted a dragon lacrima into Loxus as a kid, so he'd be valuable as an asset later on. He's what's called a second generation dragon slayer. During the fight, Natsu and Gajiel are still doing pretty well against Loxus since Mystigan wore him down, and the guild has simultaneously taken out all the lacrima at the same time. Happy! by each shooting one other than Urza, who just took out a shit ton. Loxus's plans are falling apart around him, and he isn't just pissed because he's not succeeding, it's because due to him not succeeding, he has to go further and further, or else he'll have to admit defeat. From the start, he didn't want to have everyone hurt or take hostages, he just wanted to make the guild stronger and tried to go about it by following what his father would have done, and only when reaching these later stages does he understand his father's way wasn't right. Loxus doesn't even- Ay, verdad, tengo que parar 30 minutos. Hagan, me acuerdo que paramos a los 30 minutos. ¿Está Beto en stream? 